This reading is being done with the permission of Scholastic. So, part echo, part one, says October 1933, Trossingen, Baden-Württemberg, Germany. Now, I know that 1933 is the time in between World War I and World War II. Our prologue happened 50 years before World War I, so quite a bit of time has passed between 50 years before World War I and 1933, which is between um, World War I and World War II. It also gives us a song, and um, there are a lot of songs interspersed in this book, and this one is um, Brown's Lullaby, which you might uh, recognize. A lot of people know the song. It goes, lullaby and good night, go to sleep little baby. You might know it from some other lyrics though, and um, these lyrics are a little bit different from the ones that I knew when I was a kid, but it does include it in there, and I'll try to uh, remember to post the lyrics in our um, extensions PowerPoint once I get a chance. Chapter one. In a town between the Black Forest and the Swabian Alps, Friedrich Schmidt stood on the threshold of his half-timbered house, pretending to be brave. From his vantage, he looked across the rooftops of Trossingen toward the castle-like factory looming above the town. Within its walls, a smokestack rose higher than the tallest gable and puffed a white cloud a beacon against the gray sky. Father stood behind him in the doorway. Son, you know the way. We've walked it hundreds of times. Remember, you have as much right to be on the street as the next person. Uncle Gunter will be waiting for you at the front gates. Friedrich nodded and stood taller. Don't worry, Father, I can do it. He wanted to believe his own words, that something as simple as walking to work by himself would be easy that he wouldn't need father's hawk-like presence, shielding him from the frightened or steering him around the gawkers. Hmm, I'm wondering why someone would be frightened of Friedrich when it seems that he's pretty frightened himself. I guess we'll keep reading to find out. Friedrich took a few steps towards the street, then turned to wave. Father's hair billowed from his head in a gray halo giving him a wild look. It suited him. He raised his hand in return and smiled at Friedrich, but it wasn't his usual jovial smile. It was half-hearted and worried. Were those tears in his eyes? Friedrich went back and pulled him into a hug, inhaling his persistent smell of bow resin and anise lodgenses. I'll be fine, father. It's your first day of retirement and you should enjoy it. Will you, will you join the pigeon feeders? Father laughed, holding Friedrich at arm's length. Heavens, no, I, I, do I look like I'm ready for the park bench? Friedrich shook his head, happy he'd lightened the mood. What will you do with your time? I hope you'll think about performing again. Long ago, father had played cello for the Berlin Philharmonic, but he set aside that life when he married and had children, taking a more practical job at the factory. Shortly after Friedrich was born, mother died and father was left to raise him and his sister, Elisabeth, alone. I won't likely perform with an orchestra, said father, but don't you worry. I'll have plenty to keep me busy. My books, my cello students, concerts, and I intend to start a chamber music ensemble. Father, you have the energy of three men. That is a good thing with your sister coming home today. Elisabeth will fill our house with directives and I'll need stamina for that, to be sure. I intend to convince her to take up the piano again so we can resume our Friday get-togethers beginning tonight. I miss them. Friedrich missed those evenings too. For as long as he could remember, every Friday after dinner, Uncle Gunther, father's younger brother, came for a dessert and brought his accordion. Father played cello, Friedrich Kermanta, although in truth, cello was his instrument too, and Elisabeth played piano. Father and Elisabeth would argue about everything from the choice of songs to the order in which they were played. Friedrich had given up trying to determine whether Elisabeth 
and father were opposites in nature or simply alike. Still, those were his happiest memories, the polkas, the folk songs, the spontaneous singing and laughing, even the bickering. I think we've all probably had a family get together where there's laughing and singing, but there's also arguing. Now Elizabeth would be home from nursing school for three whole months. He couldn't wait for their late night talks or passing a novel back and forth and taking turns reading it out loud. And their Sunday afternoon card games of Binopro around the kitchen table with father and uncle Boothrow. The past year hadn't been the same without Elizabeth smothering and bossing and cooking. His mouth watered just thinking about her cooking. Do you think she missed us as much as we missed her? asked Friedrich. Father smiled. How could she not? He pointed Friedrich toward the street and patted his back. Have a good day at work, son, and don't forget to, I know, father, look up. That's the end of chapter one. Chapter two. When Friedrich was around the corner, he did the opposite. He shoved his hands into his pockets, hunched his shoulders, and tilted his right cheek toward the ground. Hmm, maybe this is a clue from my question earlier, why Friedrich was, why other people were afraid of Friedrich. Something to do with his right cheek? I guess we'll find out. Father would never have tolerated this posture, but it made Friedrich feel less conspicuous, even if he was more vulnerable to things in his path. Besides, he often found the lost fennec when looking down. Soon enough, he stumbled over a bundle of newspapers that had been tossed towards the storefront. He braced himself on the building and read the headline, Parliament Passes Law. Friedrich groaned, another law for father to criticize. Since Friedrich didn't attend regular school, father insisted that they read the newspaper together every night as part of his studies. He could not count the times in recent months that father had tossed the paper aside, disgusted with the new chancellor, Adolf Hitler, and his Nazi party. Father had been a member of the German Freethinkers League until a few months ago when Hitler outlawed the organization. Just last night, after reading yet another article, father had paced the kitchen and ranted, is there no room in this country for more than one way of thinking? Hitler bullies the parliament to make laws on whims. Hitler takes away all civil rights and gives his stormtroopers the freedom to question anyone for any reason. Hitler wants to cleanse the population for a pure German race. What did all it all mean? What was a pure German race? Clear skinned and perfect? Friedrich touched his face and felt his stomach tighten with worry, especially since he was neither. He ran his fingers through his hair, which did him no service. It was thick, blonde, and tightly curled. He could feel it frizzing in the damp air, just like father's. No matter how long he let it grow, it stuck straight out instead of down. If only he had straight hair, he could let it drape across his cheek but there was no hiding his blotchy birthmark. It was as if an imaginary line had been drawn down the middle of his face and neck. And on one side, his skin was like everyone else's, but on the other, a painter had dabbled shades of purple, red, and brown, turning his cheek into a mottled plum. He knew he looked horrid, but could he blame, how could he blame people for staring or being frightened? So there's our, our answer to our question that we were having, that we had earlier. He has a birthmark that covers a lot of his face and makes it um, different color than the rest of his skin. And I guess that makes people frightened of him, which to me doesn't make sense because I know a birthmark is just a birthmark, but I guess the people in his community don't agree. At the next corner, he turned down the thoroughfare when he reached the music conservatory, he could hear someone practicing the piano in an upper story, Beethoven's Fur Elise. For this, he stopped and lifted his head, becoming lost in the music. Unconsciously, his hand rose and bounced to the time of the song. 
Friedrich smiled as he pretended the musician was following his direction. He closed his eyes and imagined the notes sprinkling down and washing his face clean. A car horn boop, started, startled him. He shoved his hand into his pockets, lowered his head and resumed walking. He kicked at a rock in his path, feeling the familiar mix of hope and dread. His audition at the conservatory, for which he'd been preparing for so, for as long as he had memory, was just after the new year. What if he did not perform well? Yet, which would be worse, to be accepted or refused? A weight pressed on his heart. How could he want something and fear it so much at the same time? He took a deep breath and kept walking. As he approached the schoolyard, he gave himself his usual lecture. Don't look, pay, don't pay attention. He tried to bolster himself with the things father always said. One foot in front of the other. Keep moving forward, ignore the ignorant. But, but without father at his side, his heart pounded and his breathing quickened. He faltered and glanced up. A group of boys huddled together on the steps, pointing at him, snickering and making faces in mock horror. He shaded his face with his hand, hung his head, and took longer strides, weaving around people until he was running. Friedrich! He almost fell over Uncle Gunther. Good morning, nephew! He put an arm around Friedrich's shoulder and drew him close. Friedrich tried to catch his breath. Good morning! Aren't you happy to see me? Because I am happy to see you. Come! He guided Friedrich through the factory gate. I'm moving over to your father's table today. We'll be side by side. Is that agreeable? Uncle Gunther was his usual jovial self and it steadied Friedrich. Of course, he said, it is what I'd hoped. As he and Uncle Gunther crossed the cobblestone square, Friedrich could feel his heart and breathing calm. The towering buildings, the stone paths, and the arched passageways all meant safety and the fat water tower, a stodgy obelisk standing sentry over the entire enclave was his guardian in disguise. It seems to me that the factory that Friedrich works at is kind of like a safe haven for him. And it is a place where he feels really comfortable. I know that we all probably have a space that feels that way. Maybe it's our bedroom or our house. Maybe um, it's a friend's house. Maybe it's outside. Um, I'd like for you to think about that feeling and see if you can connect with Friedrich. When you're scared, what happens or what do you do that comforts you? Part of him wished he could stay and work at the factory forever. The other part of him wished his life had taken a different course, that he'd been a boy who went to real school, had friends his own age, and an ordinary, unremarkable face. But fate had stepped in his path. And when he was only eight years old, he became the youngest and smallest apprentice in the biggest harmonica factory in the world. Chapter three. On that morning, four years ago. So that tells me that if he was eight when he started and the day that he started was four years ago, Another thing that we can add to our list of character traits is that Friedrich is 12 years old because he was eight when he started um, working at the factory and that was four years ago. So he's not very much older than you fifth grade students. On that morning, four years ago, Friedrich had followed Elizabeth into the primary play yard as he had every other school day. As usual, she steered him to a bench away from the others. He knew what he was supposed to do, stay there and sit still. But the night before, father had taken him to the ballet to hear the orchestra and the music had stayed with him as it always did. Every movement, every rain, refrain of Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty still played in his head, especially the waltz. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Friedrich had hummed it all the way to school and no amount of shushing from Elizabeth could make him stop. While she checked his lunch and pulled his sweater tighter around him, 
he raised his arms, waving them to conduct an imaginary orchestra. Elizabeth took both of his hands in hers, eyes pleading. She said, Friedrich, please don't make it more difficult for yourself. You already have enough problems. I hear music, he said, and I hear the names. The others will call you if you continue to wave at the sky. Do you want the boys to throw rocks at you again? He shook his head and looked up at her. Lisabeth, they call me Monster Boy. I know, she said, stroking his hair. Don't listen to them. What do I always say? They're not my family, and my family tells me the truth. Wow, I'm really starting to get a sense of another character trait we might add to Friedrich's list. He seems like he is a very family-oriented guy. So I'm gonna write that down. because of his, the reason I think this is the way that he relies on his father. Misses his sister. and looks forward to working with his uncle. Can you think of some other ways that the text has shown Friedrich is family oriented? Keep reading. That's right, and I say you are a talented musician, and someday you will be a conductor. But for now, you must only practice at home. Remember the trick I taught you? Friedrich nodded. If I think I might wave my arms at school, stuff my hands under my legs, and sit on them. Great, said Elizabeth. Now, stay here until the teacher rings the bell. I have to go or I'll be late for class. She kissed his cheek. Friedrich watched her walk toward the secondary school, her blonde curls bouncing behind her. He tucked his hands beneath his legs, but the music from the concert pestered him until he couldn't resist any longer. He freed his hands and swished an imaginary baton. Closing his eyes, he escaped into the rhythmic waltz. He didn't realize he was creating a spectacle or that all the children in the schoolyard were watching him. He was so caught up in the music that he never heard the laughing or the taunting or the boys running up behind him until it was too late. The next morning before the first bell, Father marched into the headmaster's office with Friedrich limping alongside him. I want you to see what your students did to my son yesterday. A lip so swollen he can barely talk, a cut on his forehead that had to be stitched, and a broken wrist. He'll wear the sling for weeks. The headmaster leaned back in his desk chair, his hands resting on his belly. Mr. Schmidt, the incident was no nothing more than boys being boys a little playground bullying. Friedrich needs to toughen. Skirmishes are the best thing for him if, if he is to learn to defend himself. We try to keep an eye on these things, but given his disfigurement, ooh, I don't think I like this headmaster. I don't think I like him one bit. Father's voice tightened. It's only a birthmark, if you wish, but given this imperfection, and with all that waving of his hands at the sky, he tilted his head at father. You must admit, it's odd. His strangeness bothers some of the others, frightens them. The headmaster raised one eyebrow, and he says he hears things. Father's cheeks puffed, 
and he looked as if he might explode. He hears music. He's just a little boy pretending to conduct an orchestra. I've taken him to concerts since he was three, after which he can remember the entire score. Can any of your other students do the same? Do none of them ever pretend? The headmaster's smile tightened. Of course, but the hand-waving isn't the only issue. This teacher has complained that he finishes his mathematics long before the others and that he whispers to the person in the desk next to him. Father looked at him and Friedrich nodded. Well, if he finishes before all the others, said father, perhaps the teacher could give him some extra work or allow him to read. Wouldn't that occupy him and prevent him from talking to others? I don't think you understand, said the headmaster, turning his gaze to Friedrich. Can you tell us who sits in the next desk next to you? With a fat lip, he could only mumble the name, Hansel. The headmaster turned to father and smirked. Mr. Schmidt, no one sits in the desk next, next to him. It is empty. So who exactly is this Hansel? Father knew. It was the same person Friedrich always pretended to talk to at home, the clever Hansel from the fairy tale, Hansel and Gretel, who, along with his sister, survived the witch and escaped from the dark and dangerous woods. Hmm, I'm seeing some connections to our prologue. What about you? Hansel, his friend, who would encourage Friedrich, oops, oh, sorry, Hansel, his friend, whose courage Friedrich wished he had. He has an imagination, yelled father. Your, your son is not usual and is quite possibly deficient, said the headmaster. You're right about one thing, said father. He is not usual, but look at his exam marks and you'll see he's not deficient. I'm not here to argue that point though. I'm here to tell you that from now on, I will teach him. And at the end of the year, you will prepare the exams and a teacher to administer them. The headmaster's smile disappeared. That is not acceptable. Father's, father pounded his fist on the headmaster's desk. What your students did to my son is not acceptable, and I'm prepared to go to your superiors. The headmaster tensed. He lifted a file from his desk and opened it. Well then, if that's how you wish to proceed, I see that his physician is Dr. Braun. I'm sending him a letter asking him to, do, to recommend the boy for psychiatric evaluation. I suspect there is more wrong with him than what we've discussed. There's a place for children like him, the home for unfortunates. That's an asylum, said father. Friedrich clutched father's side. Elizabeth had told him about such places where they put lunatics and took away all their clothes except their undergarments. Could he really be sent there for conducting an imaginary orchestra and talking to a make-believe friend? His head throbbed. I wanna clarify something as we're reading. I have some background knowledge about this, and I know that um, in the like earlier parts of our history, especially as early as the 1930s, places where we took care of the mentally ill or those who um, needed their mental health addressed were not good places to be. A lot of them were very dangerous and mistreated the people who lived there. But now um, people who receive help at a mental health hospital um, generally receive really good treatment and it is a good place for them to be so that they can recover or that they can get the services that they need. But in Friedrich's case, the place that the headmaster is telling him he should go is dangerous and frightening and not at all suitable um, for someone to live in. Father's voice shook. All this because he's not like the others? I am done being reasonable. He put around an arm around Friedrich, ushering him away from the office and down the hallway, now crowded with children. Friedrich saw the stairs and heard the remarks. Monster boy is leaving! Moron! Belongs in a zoo! What terrible things. What was to become of him? Elizabeth went to school all day. Father worked at the factory. Would father leave him alone, home alone, or put him away? Outside on the steps, he caught father's sleeve and tugged. 
Father stopped and leaned down. Friedrich cupped his hand over Father's ear and whispered, Where will I go, Father, if I'm too dreadful for school? Father's eyes filled with tears. He kissed him on the forehead. Don't worry. I'll take care of this. Come, we must stop at the factory so I might tell them why I did not come to work today. Friedrich sat outside a windowed office while father spoke to several white-coated supervisors. He couldn't hear what father said, but he could see his animated gestures and his pleading expressions. Afterward, father shook hands with each of the men. One blotted his eyes with a handkerchief. The door opened and the supervisors filed out. The one with the handkerchief leaned down and put a hand on Friedrich's shoulder. My name is Ernst. Your father is going to take you home to rest now, but starting tomorrow, this is where you will come. Welcome to the firm. He shook Friedrich's uninjured hand. Friedrich didn't know what it meant, but he whispered, yes, sir. As they walked home, father explained, I will oversee your schoolwork from now on. Every morning during the week, you will apprentice at the factory to learn about harmonica making. In the afternoons, you'll complete the assignments I give you at the table next to my workstation, and you'll continue your music lessons with me on weekends. Do you understand? Friedrich's wounds stung and his head ached. He didn't answer. Father stopped and knelt in front of him. Friedrich, do you understand? Where I go, you will go. He looked at father, unbelieving, he was not going to an asylum or back to school. He would no longer have to guess at the safest route to his classroom or dodge the food thrown at him at lunchtime. He would not have to determine which corner of the play yard would provide the most protection. He smiled, tears rolling down his cheeks. Father carefully lifted Friedrich into his arms and carried him. On the street, a car honked three times. The rhythm of Tchaikovsky's waltz took hold again. Looking back across father's shoulders, he lifted an imaginary baton with his good arm and conducted. When the wind brushed his face, Friedrich felt a lightness, a weightlessness, as if bit by bit, the dread and worry that always burdened him were taking flight. Had father not been holding him, he too might have floated away on the wind like a dandelion's white seeded parachutes. So we learned a lot of things about Friedrich from our reading today. Um, we talked about how he is an anxious kid, how he's 12 years old and how he's family oriented. And I encourage you to write some other things about him as I was reading. Some of the things that I um, thought about while I was reading were his birthmark, which is described in the story, so I'm not going to write it up here. Um, and then I also think that it's safe to say that Friedrich is pretty smart. The reason I think that is because he has a really good memory. He can remember the music that he hears at the orchestra. And his father said that he got good grades on all of his assessments on all of his tests. But we know the good grades aren't everything. So we'll have to keep learning about Frederick to see if he's smart in other ways besides music and his good grades. That's it for today. Um, if you would like to do some of the extensions, I have a PowerPoint that has some of the music that was talked about in the story today um, and some writing prompts and some other things that you might want to do as you are checking out um, Echo and as you are getting connected with the story.